So looking at the different types of VPN connectivity, we have clientless, which simply means you're using a browser. Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whatever your browser of choice is. And in this case, we're going to use SSL, which is TCP443 for communications. When we get to a full tunnel-based VPN with the AnyConnect, it can use SSL or it can use IPsec. There's an older IPsec VPN from Cisco. They just refer to it as Cisco VPN, which is IPsec only. And then our site-to-site -site VPNs tend to be IPsec only. So you'll see SSL marketed as something newer and fancier and better, right? It costs more money because we have to actually pay for the number of currently uh, concurrently connected users for SSL VPN. But when comparing SSL to IPsec, is SSL more secure? Any ideas? It seems like it's newer. It must be better, right? But Sean says it's not any more secure. Is it faster? Is there less overhead? I don't think so either. Does it save us any money? No, it costs more. So why on earth are we doing SSL instead of IPsec? Any ideas? This has definitely gained a lot of popularity. It would be the more fashionable. Sean says, I run PCI scans regularly, and every day there's a new SSL vulnerability. Right. There's no way that Heartbleed would have affected IPsec. Um, Ashley says, less management and overhead of client machines. Sean says, ease of use. Tell you what, this is remote access only. IPsec is site to site and remote access. So this is only a remote access technology, which starts to clue us into what's actually happening. With IPsec, remember when you create a VPN connection from your hotel over hotel Wi-Fi or over the network at the hotel, we'll just imagine there's a cable here, and you hit this hotel router or firewall, we don't know who owns this. We don't know what brand it is. We don't know what the rules are. But if I try to create an IPsec VPN, you know, let's, let's finish this drawing. We'll say here's the internet. Here's our ASA. And it's located at headquarters. So when I build a VPN into this thing, if I were to use IPsec, does anybody know what ports are required to be functional on the hotel gateway? And Sean is nailing this. That's the spoiler alert. SSL is generally opened outbound anywhere. So Ashley says, for this to work with IPsec, there's a few things we have to allow. First off, UDP 500 needs to be permitted out. Kind of a weird one, this is used for ISA camp negotiations. Internet Security Association Key Management Protocol works on UDP 500. What they do there over UDP 500 is they talk about setting up a VPN. So you can authenticate and you can negotiate security associations. We can negotiate essays. Once our essays have been created, perfect. Sean's just feeding me the answers. He's, he's seen this episode before. He knows how this goes. We can use ESP to encapsulate all of our data. Now, when an ESP packet hits this firewall, what might be the problem? And it doesn't always have to be the problem, but we have no idea what type of device that is. It could be a D-Link. It could be a Linksys. It could be something crummy. ESP could be blocked. I actually got this a, a lot in the CCNA security exam. Perfect. This is most commonly why remote access VPN fails. Because we're sending in ESP packets. What layer does ESP work at of the OSI model? Anybody know?
it's going to be layer four. It rides on top of IP, which rides on top of Ethernet. The problem is, what is this remote router or firewall doing at this hotel? What is he doing to all of the hotel guests' traffic when it traverses this device? When my laptop's going out to Google, what's happening to those IP headers? Perfect. So NAT, and more specifically, port address translation. So every packet that goes through needs a port number so it can be padded. Well, if we look at an ESP packet, and let's just do that real quick. We'll pop over to, it's been like an entire 30 minutes without going to Google Images. If you've sat in class with me before, you know that Google can make prettier images faster than I can. So let's take a look at what an ESP header looks like. There you have it. It's got something called a security parameter index, which is a 32-bit value for each flow. It has a sequence number. It has encrypted payload, which is going to be variable based on how much we're encrypting, and then a pointer that shows us what the next header is. Again, encrypted, and then authentication data, which is basically for an integrity check. So to make sure that this encrypted data wasn't altered as it passed through the internet, we can do an integrity check on it. What don't we see here that TCP and UDP have? Port numbers. So if you look at an ASA, ASAs are actually smart enough to do inspection of the security parameter index. So they think SPI. Let's see ESP inspection, maybe. SPI is a little bit heavily utilized. ASA inspection with IPsec. So you can use an ASA, and you can actually do inspection of ESP traffic. And he can have multiple VPNs going through the ASA, and he adds them to the state table by using stateful packet inspection and using the ESP header and focusing on the security parameter index. He uses that just like a port number, but it's off by default. So this is something that ASAs can do that's off by default, and additionally, it's something not a lot of people are aware of. So what that brings us to is this situation. So we know that PAT needs to occur. We know that we need port numbers, which ESP doesn't have. An ASA can save the day, but to do so, he needs to do inspection of ESP. So chances are this hotel may not have ASA firewalls. It might have something really simple that can't do that ESP inspection. So what happens is we negotiate our VPN tunnel over UDP 500. What does that look like? Well, you launch your VPN client, you connect to the ASA, it prompts you for authentication, you type in your username and password, it assigns you an IP address over Ike, it signs you a firewall policy, a split tunneling policy, and so forth. It tells you that you are connected. Now, you open up remote desktop connection, you try to RDP into something, you try to SSH into something, and you don't connect. You open up your VPN client and you look at the packet count, you see lots of packets transmitted, none received. What's happening there is you're sending those ESP packets out, they're hitting the first top router and they're being discarded because there's no port number. So you connect to the VPN, but you can't actually pass traffic back and forth. So the way that we resolve that is by coming in here and wrapping this ESP header with the UDP header. So this is extra overhead, extra encapsulation, but it fixes our issue with PAT, right? We can PAT that traffic through because now we have port numbers, which makes this firewall happy. What's the caveat to doing NAT traversal or NAT T? This is great because it can get us through the firewall, but sometimes this doesn't work. Any ideas as to why? Some of the guys that run these firewalls on cruise ships and airlines and hotels, they don't know to allow UDP 4500 through. So we can enable NAT T or NAT traversal. It can be pushed down from the headquarters ASA to the user. It'll tell him you should be using NAT traversal. And he goes, awesome, I'm gonna send packets out 
on UDP 4500. But the administrator of that firewall goes, I'm only going to allow required protocols. I'm going to allow TCP 443, TCP port 80, TCP port 25, UDP 53, and nowhere in his list of top 10 port numbers was he thinking of this one. So it is pretty cool. It's phenomenal when it works right. But what you're going to have are users that say, I don't know what the heck the problem is. This worked all week. Last week when I was in Seattle, now I'm in Minneapolis and the VPN won't connect. And you look at the ASA and you go to the monitoring tab and you go, we've got 63 users connected. It's not the ASA. He's fine. I see you authenticating. It says you're logged in. Something must be wrong with your network. So this, you had this problem of remote users never being able to predict what was going on wherever they were going to be, be it a cruise ship, uh, all-inclusive resort. Let's think about happy places, not just technical conferences. But you know, whenever they travel, they want to make sure that they can get in. What SSL VPN is going to allow us to do is go over TCP 443. So the general population believes SSL VPN is better when in reality you're using the same many times encryption and hashing algorithms you have additional overhead you have retransmissions of data so it's over it's it's not as efficient as it was but it always works i say always loosely because tcp443 is commonly allowed so we got pretty nerdy there for like the first moment of the first day we we're like three slides in and we're like all right let's jump into protocol headers but I hope this all made sense. How are you guys doing? Give me a thumbs up if you're keeping up. Everybody doing all right? Fantastic, awesome. So this is, this is kind of why SSL is preferred over IPsec. They're using the same encryption, they're using the same hashing. It's just TCP 443 is probably gonna work. So, We'll get into some more detail on what's going on in the background as we as we progress. Um, just in case you're not a uh, the type of person that reads crypto books at nighttime or over breakfast with your cereal, when you see SSL, this is really the same thing as TLS, not TSL, but TLS, Transport Layer Security. Uh, SSL was designed by Netscape, wasn't officially a standard, so TLS or Transport Layer Security is. DTLS is Datagram TLS. What that means is it can use UDP 443 because UDP packets have less overhead than a TCP packet. And in the event that my remote desktop traffic drops or my SSH traffic drops, let's say I'm running PuTTY over here and I'm on hotel Wi-Fi and hotel Wi-Fi sometimes isn't very good. So I was, I've got maybe about 20% packet loss. Well, whenever that packet loss is occurring, it's getting worse because PuTTY wants to, of course, use TCP and retransmit. Well, my SSL VPN client as well sees a packet loss, so he retransmits. So anytime you're using TCP for a VPN, you could have dual retransmissions. Does that make sense? I know that orange doesn't stand up very good on this, on this particular color background. But just to kind of highlight this, PuTTY is using TCP and the AnyConnect client is using TCP. So you've got this TCP header here for a VPN and you've got a TCP header that's being encrypted. Those dual retransmissions are making things even slower and even worse. What DTLS does Datagram TLS, and I assume blue isn't going to show up on blue very well, um, uses UDP 443. So now we're back into no man's land. We've got these protocols that not everybody's going to allow through. But if they do allow it through, we're going to be able to send data more efficiently. Efficiently, We have less overhead and we no longer have dual retransmissions. So SSL and TLS, for our purposes today, are the same thing. DTLS is slightly different because this is a UDP implementation of TLS. So what happens is your session starts off TCP 443 and then it tries to transition into DTLS. If for some reason UDP 443 isn't allowed through, 
we detect the failure and we do what's called DTLS fallback. You can guess what that is. DTLS isn't working, so we're gonna go back to using traditional TLS.